Now the agenda for this presentation will be like this. Some of the important concepts in GST, the amendments that have been made over a period of time, depending upon what the government thought should be amended. Now I'll get into some of the important concepts in GST and then the amendments so that we really know what exactly has happened in GST. Now, these are the important concepts in GST. Supply, the earlier concepts of manufacture, sale, then the providing of service, all have been replaced by supply. So the earlier taxable event was if you manufacture, you pay excise duty. If you sell, you pay VAT. And then if you provide a service, you pay the service tax. All that is now replaced by the concept of supply. So, so when we look at uh, supply definition is quite wide to, lay, to take into account all possible situations. Then registration, it also talks about when you should register, where you should register, etc. Then value of supply, on what value you will have to pay the tax. Time of supply, when you will have to pay the tax. It there are uh, provisions for it. So whether it's at the time of raising an invoice or when you have to receive an amount, or when you have to supply the goods. So all that is there. Then there's a concept called place of supply. That is whether to see whether it is an IGST transaction or a intrastate transaction, there are provisions for it. Then the ITC, input tax credit, returns. In fact, I should point out the definition of uh, the input tax credit in GST has been quite wide, much better than what we used to have in the earlier regime. But then we always had its own uh, uh, disappointing features also. We'll have, a see, we'll have a look at it. Then returns, refunds, then transition provisions, EWA bill, advanced ruling. Then uh, there is a mechanism called anti-profiteering because if the rates of the taxes are uh, less now compared to what it was before, then the expectation was that the business have to pass it on to the consumer down the line. Now, how do you implement it, etc.? That's an, um, a task by itself. Then appeal, inspection, search, and seizure. These are the important concepts in uh, uh, GST. Now, what has been the important amendments done so far? Uh, now, in GST, what happens is, apart from the definition of supply, there is also the few schedules in GST, like a schedule one, a schedule two, and a schedule three. Now schedule one refers to those transactions where it will be subjected to GST even if you don't receive any consideration for it because the definition of supply is that you should supply goods and services for a consideration. So schedule one is slightly a departure from that. So if you supply goods and services in certain situations, even if you don't receive any consideration that will be subjected to tax. Now that was schedule one. Schedule two was listing out certain transactions as goods and services. So if your particular activity, whether it will be taxed as goods or whether it will be taxed as a service. For example, works contract. In the earlier regime, it's a combination of goods and services. So the goods portion of it was subjected to tax by the state department or by the state and the service was subjected to the, ser the service tax by the VAT department or by the service tax department. Now what has happened is the entire activity that is supply of goods and services are subjected to taxability as a service. So therefore schedule two has these bifurcations of whether it is goods and services. So there was a small confusion in schedule two. So whether schedule two transactions can be subjected to tax without being satisfying definition of the general definition of supply that they have amended the definition to say schedule two transactions also should satisfy the definition of supply. That's a welcome uh, amendment they have made. Similarly, turnover limit for composition levy for suppliers of goods and service increased to one and a half crores. Then in this, the issue was whether it only for goods or it can even be for services. One of the amendment that weighed was person can supply services of a value not exceeding 10% of the turnover in the preceding financial year <coughs> or 5 lakh of rupees, which was earlier. <clears throat> they also gave a, a concessional rate of tax to person who is engaged only in providing of a service and where the turnover does not exceed 50 lakhs, he can pay tax as a composite taxpayer 
at 6%. <clears throat> Schedule 3, <clears throat> a pre-GST regime, <clears throat> lot of transactions were not clear whether you are subjecting it to tax or not. Now, Schedule 3 in GST was listing out all those transactions which will not be subjected to GST. So it will either be considered a supply of goods or it will not be considered a supply of services. Now, there were a lot of transactions, for example, transactions which are considered as high sea sales or sale of goods that takes place from customs bonded warehouses. Or we used to have a transaction called drop shipment. <clears throat> drop shipment is where you have a supplier outside India, you have a purchaser outside India, but then you have somebody in India who is in a position to connect both. So suppose let's assume I have, um, I have taken the name of Harrison's because she is as part of the panel here. Harrison's arranges for <clears throat> the purchase of goods from somebody in Singapore and then you have a customer in uh, <clears throat> let's assume in China. Therefore, the goods will be purchased by Harrison from the person in Singapore and sold by Harrison to a customer in China. But the goods will not come to India at all. Goods will go directly from Singapore to China. So since, the, since Harrison's appears to be in uh, India, so whether these transactions are subjected to tax because in a very financial you, the Harrison's India will always purchase goods and supply goods. So whether you will be undertaking a supply. <clears throat> so we took a view that uh, this drop shipments will not be subjected to GST because goods will not come to India. Similarly, high sea sales, transactions that happen outside the country. So all this they have now clarified as part of Schedule 3 that these transactions will not be subjected to GST, drop shipment, <clears throat> high sea sales and sale of goods from the customs bonded warehouse. So these are all good amendments that take place, that have taken place over a period of time. Now, few notifications that got issued. One is all suppliers of goods accepting composition dealers are exempted from paying GST on advances received. Hence liability would be at the time of issuance invoice. And similar exemption, of course, is not available for supplier of service because the time of supply provisions under GST always says whichever is the earliest would be the time of supply. So suppose you receive a payment, which is the nature of an advance or you supply goods or you raise an invoice, whichever is earliest will be the time of supply. So there were difficulties whether for goods where advances were received, you should pay the tax. They have issued a notification saying it is exempted from payment of tax for the accepting the composition dealers. But as far as service is concerned, it was always subjected to tax even pre-GST regime, even the service tax regime, it was subjected to tax. Therefore, that exemption is not available for supplier of service. Similarly, for transfer of what is called a development right, when a developer develops the property as he purchases from a landowner and then builds flats. So when he gets the uh, rights to develop it, that's what is called a transfer of development right. So there will be supply of service, whether it will be subjected to tax, but always a controversy that was going on pre-GST and post-GST also. So somewhere in 2019, they put some sort of a rest to this controversy by saying that the liability to pay tax shall arise only when the, there is a date of issuance of the completion certificate for the project. So these are all small, small amendments that have been made trying to clarify the issues from time to time. Uh, similarly, for uh, Kerala flood says they have introduced a rule 32A in which they say that the value determined in terms of section 15 will be the basis for payment of cess but shall not include the set cess. That's one of the amendments they have made. Similarly, for specific transactions like supply of lottery or betting, etc., they have indicated what will be the value for the purpose of payment of GST so that they can reduce the controversies in these transactions over a period of time. Now, for certain activities like uh, renewable energy devices or their parts for the manufacture of various uh, items like biogas plants, solar power based, etc., they have said that the out of the total transaction, deem 70% to be the value of the goods and the remaining 30% to be the value of the service. This more or less fell in line with what was the uh, situation pre GST, but then they wanted again, there was a confusion as to whether the whole thing will be a service, whole thing will be goods what will be the rate of tax, because there were varying rates for 
the goods and varying rates for the service which you will apply so that in somewhere in 2018 they have issued this notification saying that this is how you will pay the tax similarly for specific activities like uh, construction service restaurant service etc they have introduced a concessional rate of tax uh, similarly for input tax credit they have said it will not exceed 110% of the eligible credit in respect of invoices or debit notes which have been uploaded and then 86a these are all few amendments that have come over a period of time over their experience that uh, maybe there is an uh, blockage of revenue there is an uh, taking of an input credit over a period of time without uh, really looking at whether the person supplying has paid the tax etc so the 86a and all are uh, provisions that have been introduced enabling the officer to block the credit uh, which is available where the supplier has not paid the tax etc so the of course the validity of all these provisions are uh, open to challenge because if my supplier has not paid the tax but i have paid him the tax so can you block the credit in my hands these are all issues that are coming up for uh, adjudication by the courts now similarly for specified fabrics the there was an uh, provision to say that if there is an uh, accumulated input tax credit then that input tax credit will lapse because of the uh, particular situation of course the, the courts have uh, taken a different view on this similarly the they have introduced an amendment to rule 895 where if in an inverted duty structure where the in the tax on the output is uh, less as compared to the inputs they said that inverted refund we will give only if for the inputs and not for the input services that again has been subjected to a, a challenge and similarly they have introduced a rule 9610 uh, which according to me was slightly uh, uh, incorrect because on persons who are exporting goods on payment of tax they said that ref and you are entitled for a refund you are not entitled for the refund if you have got one advance authorization which you have got so even though you would not have used the advance authorization inputs in the export of the final product so even in such situations they have said you will not be entitled for a refund of the uh, uh, tax paid on the exports so of course these are all subjected to challenge now so some amendments as i said some amendments they have made for the clarifying the position giving benefit but there are some amendments they have made where we thought that these amendments were going um, beyond the either the provisions or were militating against the purpose of this uh, very provisions itself now of course few amendments as i said they have made 864a where a person claiming refund of any amount paid as tax wrongly paid then the, it can be recredited in the electronic credit ledger in fact this amendment should have come long back Uh, this was a case where uh, suppose somebody instead of paying liable to pay 50 crores um, credits or debits a 500 crores by any typing mistake and he has a huge credit so he thereafter finds that about 450 crores has been paid in excess so he has to take it back uh, in my view it should have been an automatic situation where you uh, credit your uh, credit ledger by the excess of 450 crores but somewhere the the system was designed in such a way that you can't credit the 450 crores back you have to claim a refund so these issues were coming up now they have introduced a provision to say yes the officer can recredit the uh, amount back so this is one welcome uh, feature they have made now uh, similarly when they are talking about a turnover of zero rated supply of goods they have introduced an explanation saying that the the eligible refund of the unutilized itc shall not exceed 1.5 times the value of the like goods uh, how this will get implemented how this will uh, rather play out for the exporters etc has to be seen uh, and how uh, right it is for the government to introduce this provision also we are not too sure but these are some of the amendments that have been uh, made over a period of time now transitional credit which i thought from my perspective was the the Uh, the department's position has been extremely disappointing now the whole expectation in gst was that whatever credit was available pre gst regime should automatically come to the post gst regime so in should in fact it should not even be 
a situation where an SSC goes to the department and files a declaration. So he has to automatically come into his credit ledger. But uh, somewhere the government has been slightly, uh, if I may use the expression, stubborn and obstinate in saying that uh, you have to file a declaration. If you make a mistake, then you should tell us why you made a mistake. Then if you had some technical issues, you are not able to upload into the system. Give us proof that you tried uploading into the system. We will check whether those proofs are right. If you are satisfied, we will allow you to modify the system. Otherwise, we will not allow you the credit. Uh, to me, all this, this entire objections are, uh, are unnecessary because these are all credits that were otherwise eligible under the earlier regime. In fact, uh, I am told and I'm also seeing there are about 500, 600 writ petitions filed across the country only on the strand one credit for some of them have gone to the Supreme Court and most of the times the high courts have held in favor of the SSC, but somewhere the, uh, the benefit still has to come down to the SSCs at a later point of time. Now, similarly, the expression eligible duties and taxes, they have said, says what you have paid and is available as credit will not be available as uh, a credit to you, which again I thought was uh, uh, unnecessary because CES was otherwise paid during the pre-GST regime and they have available as a credit to me. Therefore, to say that I will not be eligible to transition to the GST regime was unfair. So how uh, that will play out also, we are not too sure. So these are all some of the changes which I thought in a transitional credit should not have been made and the transitional credit should have been given as a matter of right to all the SSCs. In fact, it should automatically flow from the, the earlier return to the system, even without the SSCs filing a declaration or an application for it. But this is something which is creating really a difficulty for a lot of SSCs. There are some miscellaneous changes that have been made. One is earlier, you used to have a situation where for every tax invoice, only one debit note can be issued because the system was designed in such manner so some amendments have been made saying that for a number of tax invoices, you can issue a consolidated debit note, which has been quite uh, welcomed by the department, by the SSCs. Now they have introduced rule 138E. Uh, this is something where I again thought was uh, unnecessary because uh, this was resulting a situation where the eBay bill facility can be blocked by the department if you, are, if you don't file your return. And the difficulty in filing the return was that you cannot file a return unless you pay the entire tax. So even if, let's assume you have a 100 rupees uh, tax liability and you have a 95 rupees credit and a five rupees of cash payment has to be made, but for some reasons you don't have the money to make payment of that five rupees, then you can't file the return at all. And if you can't file the return for two consecutive periods, then your eBay bill is blocked. And if you can't generate an eBay bill, you can't do your business, you can't move the goods. This I thought was uh, against the provisions of Article 14, uh, but then these, cha these changes have been made in the whole guise of uh, implementing an eBay bill system. There are some, uh, I would say, uh, disappointing features which should not have been there in the first place or which should have been uh, rectified over a period of time. 